Thank you for joining us at Strange Pathways this week. As ever, I am your host, Scott Mort. I hope you've had a wonderful week. My week has been great, really taking advantage of that three-day weekend, really, really resting up. I, uh, I busted my butt at work on Friday and came home with just sore knee, sore ankle. I, I damaged my ankle whenever I was 16. And it never really healed right. And because of that, my knee on the other side, it's called a compensational injury. My knee is starting to degrade on the other side of my body. I try not to let it slow me down. I I try not to let pain define me. Sometimes, though, it's really rough. My lovely wife, though, Ariana, takes wonderful care of me. I, uh, I don't know how I made it without her. She is... She is my light. She is my life. I, uh, I sincerely hope that each one of you have somebody in your life like I have with Ariana. Our first story is going to take us all the way back to the late 1800s in Berlin, Germany. Now, this story, I, uh, I got this from Frank Edwards, strangest of all. If you've never heard of Frank Edwards, I strongly, strongly suggest looking up uh, anything that he's done, quite honestly. He was, he was kind of like the Art Bell of the 1940s and 50s. Frank Edwards was, was like one of my first introductions to UFOs and paranormal phenomena. Uh, my cousin Cindy gave me a book called UFOs Serious Business, but... As I said, this is from his book, Frank Edwards' Strangest of All. This has taken us to a a gentleman named Wilhelm von Austin. And he he believed that the world was making a horrible mistake. Von Austin was an absolute believer that animals were incredibly intelligent. Close to, on par perhaps surpassing that of humans. He had a small inheritance, and this allowed him to kind of push forward with a few experiments. He, he believed animals were dumb, but only because they did not have the benefit of a higher education. His first student was an elderly circus bear. Now, he didn't get very far with his experiments because Von Austin's landlord wasn't too happy with the fact that a bear was living in Von Austin's apartment. Uh, The neighbors weren't happy about it. He would apparently just hour after hour scream, one, two, three, trying to teach this bear how to count. Uh, he, He tried to teach it the fundamentals of of arithmetic. He, he tried to teach it how to read. And finally, the bear, the bear had enough of it and just chased Von Austin down the stairs. Von Austin went one way, the bear went another, and into history. And he, Von Austin starts to come up with theories. He thinks that maybe the bear was so old it had lost its hearing he goes and he tries a few other experiments. He decides to go towards horses. His, his first student, 1896, his first student was named Hans. He's a, he's a Russian stallion. He's young. He's intelligent for a horse. And Austin makes so much progress that, that pretty soon Hans gets the nickname Clever. Clever Hans. And it does seem, it does seem that, that Clever Hans is learning the lessons. So the lessons, the lessons went as such. He had a table in front of Clever Hans. 
and he would place a skittle. I had to look this up. I didn't know this. Skittles is is kind of a, a game that's played. So it was a, a small little bowling pin. Think of a bowling pin that's about three inches high. That's a skittle. And he would repeat to the horse, one, one, one. And pretty soon he's teaching Hans to paw one time with his hoof each time he heard the word one and saw the object on the table. Von Austin eventually, over the span of about a month, teaches clever Hans to count up to four. Now, this is kind of a rapid pace. Now, Von Austin soon replaces the skittle with figures on a blackboard. The results seem to indicate, yeah, Hans is reading these numbers and is able to do the arithmetic associated with these numbers. Now, Clever Hans starts to get famous. Word of him spreads pretty rapidly, and he attracts the attention of a few scholars. One of these scholars, Professor Claripedi of the University of Geneva, spent weeks testing Clever Hans. He is quoted as saying, and I quote, Hans could do more than mere sums. He knew how to read. He could distinguish between harmonious and dissonant chords of music. He also had an extraordinary memory. He could tell the date of each day by the current week. In short, he got through all the tasks which an intelligent schoolboy of 14 is able to perform. So, Professor Claripedi, he, he posed oral questions and written problems in the cube root, and in every single instance, Clever Hans pot out the correct answers. There wasn't even hesitation. Someone noticed the clever Hans was always correct if he tapped out the answers instantly. If he hesitated, he had to think about it, sometimes he was wrong. And it was thought that, you know, okay, certain prodigies are like this. It's, it's one of those deals where if they have to think about it, they're going to be wrong. But they go by that instinct. They hit that instinct, and yeah, they're usually right. Visitors are flocking to see clever Hans from all over to, to see this, this living proof that von Austin was right. Animals are just as intelligent as we are. Now, there are those that, that flatly branded him a, a fake, a fraud. And pretty soon, there, there's a whole committee created to figure out whether Clever Hans is, is a legitimate phenomena or an amazing hoax. There were professors of psychology, physiology, zoology, medicine, along with a circus manager, a trio of veterinarians. This group spent five weeks examining, uh, bickering back and forth, they, they, they talked amongst themselves. They ran theories and tests. And then they decided on what they had seen. Their report set down their experience in a very factual manner. They had seen this horse do some complicated math. The horse tapped out replies to questions. He performed in a way that said, this is an intelligence, this is genuine, and if it's not genuine, it's an amazing trick. This is the argument I give about the Patterson film. If the Patterson film does indeed show a Bigfoot, uh, forgive me for getting just slightly off topic, but if, a Patterson, if the Patterson film does show a Bigfoot, then the film needs to be studied. Because it is the legitimate footage of an unknown, upright, large creature. If it is a fake, it still needs to be studied. Because it is one of the greatest, if not the greatest, hoaxes of all time. The 
the the committee offers no definite conclusion. Part of them think that it's a hoax. Part of them think that it's it's true. They everything was very factual in the report. There are several newspapers though that that denounce Clever Hans as a fraud, and a second committee is appointed. Now, on this committee is one Oscar Funst. He's the head of the Berlin Psychological Laboratory. And it was no secret that he did not have much faith in Clever Hans. So he's going into this biased. He came to such a massive conclusion about Hans that an entire book was written by him. Now, I'm not going to go through the entire book, but the gist of the book, Clever Hans, 1908, he believed that Clever Hans was a hoax, a fraud. He thought Hans had no intelligence past any other horse, but that Hans was getting subtle signals from Von Austin movements of the hand, different shadings of the voice that cued Hans for his replies. To me, that's that's pretty impressive anyway. The book had what I believe is Funk's desired effect. Public opinion kind of swayed from clever Hans and, and Van Austin. Von Austin tried to get a third committee together, but no one no one wanted to go against Oscar Funk's book. Wilhelm von Austin died June of 1909, lonely, angry, 71 years old. There was though there was one person who found this at least interesting. A wealthy manufacturer of the town of Elberfeld, uh, a Mr. Kroll. Mr. Kroll had gotten clever Hans in Von Austin's will. And he decided, okay, he's, he's going to test this horse. Kroll was kindly, he was quiet, never really lost his temper. And it is said that under the tutelage of Kral, Hans expanded his abilities. He became a more reliable student. There were no longer these mental collisions between the horse and the owner. There was a, there was a fondness between the two, people said. Now... A lot of people would think that, you know, Clever Hans, the idea of him being shot down would be a detriment. Kral didn't see it that way. He was able to teach Hans without the detriment of an audience. He didn't have to impress anyone. No one cared anymore. So Kral ends up buying these two Arabian stallions, Muhammad and Zarif. And under Kral's tutelage, the Arabian stallions seemed to learn faster than Hans did. Within two weeks of the first lesson, Muhammad is doing small math problems correctly. He, he learned to distinguish tens from the units. Uh, he strikes tens with his left hoof and the units with the right. He knows the meaning of the plus and the minus symbols. 18 days after his first lesson, Muhammad is ready to be introduced to multiplication and division of small numbers. After four months, Muhammad could extract square and cube roots. A few months later, he's taught to spell and he's able to read this, uh, this strange alphabet that crawls developed. Now, Zarif, he's, he's progressing too, but not, not 
quite as fast as Muhammad. There's about six months of training and Kral starts to bring in visitors, thousands of visitors, and they're admitted free of charge. He, he wanted to be free of any suspicion that he was using these horses for a monetary gain. He's, he's got plenty of money. He doesn't need it. These horses tapped out replies to questions from thousands of visitors. And Funk's theory is shot down. These horses, these new horses, under the tutelage of Krull, they perform equally well whether Krull's there or not. Now remember, they were taught an alphabet, so they're able to tap out like a, a crude Morse code with their, their hoofs. Professor Clara Petey, he he was conducting lengthy experiments in the summer of 1913. And one of the new horses, Zarif, he stops in the middle of the session. And Clara Petey goes, why? And then Zarif taps up, tired, pain in leg. That's kind of incredible. Now, a Dr. Scholler and a Dr. Gerke stated in their reports uh, working with these horses, they asked Mohammed why he did not reply to them with speech instead of tapping out answers. And they said Mohammed tried to, to mimic speech. He tried to make words. And then... Muhammad goes over and taps out with his hoof. I have not a good voice. 1912, Kral publishes a book about the incredible experiences he has with the horses of Elberfeld. Did Kral prove Wilhelm von Austin's theory? is the reason that dumb animals are dumb is because we keep them that way. I'm, I'm an animal lover. I'm not fond of horses, though. I deal with horses on a near daily basis, and I'm not fond of them. But I do know this. I have five cats. I love my five cats. Each one of them has their own personality. My dog has his own personality too. Once you start to, to really be close to an animal in your home, a pet, you do start to have a, a strange communication with them. You can tell what they need, what they want, by the way they hold themselves, the tone of their meow or bark. I guess whenever I play howl with my dog Pebbles and he howls back, is that a type of communication? I personally, in my heart of hearts, believe that animals are a lot smarter than we give them credit for. What do you think? Our next story takes us all the way to 1997. Now, this story, this was told to the amazing Brad Steiger by one Jerry Levesque. Now, Jerry Levesque told Brad Steiger that over a two-week period in 1997, that his girlfriend, Kelly, received an amazing amount of phone calls from someone that she believed to be him. Now, Levesque is quoted as saying, fortunately, because we were going steady, I had occasion to call Kelly in between calls from this imposter. I say fortunately because he usually asked Kelly to meet him in some lonely place. And fortunately, 
of what we later learned about the other me. Now, the first time that Kelly got a call from imposter Jerry, he wanted her to meet him at a local restaurant as soon as possible. She was getting ready and she would have left her apartment. But Jerry knocked on the door and, and she was puzzled. She, what, what are you here? And she asked him, did, did the plans change? Now, Jerry had come directly from his job. He, was, he worked at a dry cleaner's. He actually stopped by to see if Kelly wanted to see a movie. They had no plans for the evening. Now, the next evening, Kelly knew Jerry would be working very late. And she answers the telephone. And she hears Jerry's voice on the other end of the telephone. And he asks, where were you last night? He says he waited at the restaurant for hours and she didn't show up. And he actually, like, whenever she goes, you came by. We, we went to see a movie. The Jerry imposter gets very angry with her. Calls her a little twit. And he begins to rage on the phone. Kelly hangs up the phone. And the more that Kelly thinks about it, the less that this voice sounds like Jerry. Now, Kelly decides to pick up the phone, calls Jerry back at work, and she knows Jerry's boss doesn't like uh, him getting personal calls, especially over time. But she's considering this an emergency. And Kelly is very satisfied with Jerry's response. She doesn't think it was him. Two hours later, the phone rings again. And it's Jerry or the imposter. He goes, meet me out by Miller's Pond near the old mill. Kelly goes, it's late. You got to be tired. And Jerry says, yeah, I am. But seeing you will wake me up. The Jerry imposter uses an old, old word that means fatigued. I'm not going to tell you what it is uh, because it, it's changed meaning over the years. And now this word, it's kind of a rude word. But he uses this and she goes, what? And she goes, this isn't you. She goes, whoever you are. You're not the real Jerry. Just leave me alone. Now, the imposter at the other end pleads with her. Please, if you will not meet me at Miller's Pond, at least come down to the corner and speak with me. And she goes, maybe. And she says, and I quote, this is Kelly's own testimony. I kept watching the corner for any sign of a man. I might suppose was the person pertained to be Jerry on the telephone. I knew I was taking a risk, but I wanted to get all these weird things resolved. If it was a friend of ours playing a joke, I would give him a piece of my mind before Jerry gave him a lump with his fist. Amazingly, around midnight, I saw Jerry, my Jerry, walk slowly up the street corner in front of my apartment building and look up at my window. He waved and smiled and I waved and got my sweater. When I got about six feet away from him, I stopped and looked at him very carefully. He did look an awful lot like Jerry, but he was wearing some kind of heavy work boots, a baseball cap, a brown leather jacket, kind of like the type I've seen in old movies that pilots wore in World War II. When I commented about the heavy boots, he said that I knew that he had just come home from work. I commented that the laundry business must be getting tougher. He reached out his hand and asked me to come with him. The light from the street lamp was fairly bright, and I could clearly see that. Except for the way he was dressed, he certainly did look like Jerry Levesque. But then I said, Jerry, you always told me you hated to wear baseball caps. And he took off the cap. This imposter had a crew cut, a hairstyle that Jerry Levesque would not have in a million years. I shouted at him. So you think I'm a twit, do you? 
and I started to run back into the apartment building. At that same moment, Jerry, the real Jerry, pulled up in his car next to the imposter. What happened next, though unbelievable, really did happen. The phony Jerry let out a high-pitched scream and literally disappeared. Now, whatever this thing was, this imposter, this mimic, it tried to contact Kelly once more, five days later. Kelly thought for sure she was talking to the real Jerry. Until Jerry asked her to drive out to the park and meet him for a picnic. The park is four miles out of town. Kelly knew that the real Jerry knew that her car was in the garage. Kelly screams at the imposter. Says, leave her alone. Never call again. And the imposter never did. What was the real game here? What did this imposter hope to gain? Did this imposter hope to replace Jerry Levesque? Did this imposter hope to whisk Carrie off to some other land, a different dimension? Maybe it was more sinister than that. Maybe this imposter wished to do Carrie some harm. It's a terrifying thought. So much of our communication involves just listening to another person's voice. Like you're doing to me right now. The only thing you know of me is my voice. Even at that, this thing looked enough like Jerry to be passable. Were it not for odd clothing, odd uses of language, Carrie would not have been able to recognize this was not her Jerry. How many of our family members and friends, how many of them have been replaced by mimics? Is it at all possible? I think we all have that one friend or that one family member who has had like a drastic personality switch. And just doesn't seem themselves anymore. Is it possible that it's not that they don't seem themselves, but they are literally not themselves any longer? Our final story takes us to summer of 1971, all the way over to Spain. A little town called Belmez de la Moraleda, commonly known as just Belmez. Now, Belmez is really a small community. The last population count was 1,833 souls. The tower of the old church raises high above any of the other houses in the city. Now, we're going to go to the living room of number five, Rodriguez Acosta Street. The youngest of the five children in the Pereira Sanchez family is playing and he starts crying and he points to something on the wall of the hearth. Now this is where the family cooks their meals and stokes the fire. They use olive logs to, to warm themselves in the, in the chilly winter months. When the parents looked at the fireplace, they noticed markings in the tile that looked incredibly like a human face. They rubbed at the tile, trying to remove the image, thinking it was just a case of pareidolia. The soot had made an interesting pattern. They rubbed at it and tried to remove it. This, this had no effect. They thought, ah, it's probably just a grease stain. 
It didn't disappear, though. So they chipped away at it. They cut away at the tile surface. And within a few hours, the face reappeared. And then another face. And then a third in the cement floor. There was the face of a little girl, a man with a long beard, and a nun staring out from the hearth, and growing, it seemed, out of the floor and the walls. There was also a Latin cross and a Greek cross. There was no sign of paint, no sign of any pigmentation whatsoever. And then the father of the family, Juan Pereira, his wife Maria, they noticed something even more terrifying. The face's expressions had changed. The woman, she first was smiling. Now her expression was that of torment, sadness, eyes wide, mouth open as if crying for help. As often happened, word spreads beyond the village. Newspaper reporters, television crews, radio teams began to arrive and investigate the phenomenon of what became known as the Faces of Bel Mez. Number 5 Rodriguez Acosta Street became known as the Enchanted House. Local authorities ordered an examination of the property. There was very, very staunch security. Doors and windows were bolted. The floor of the hearth was dug up. And at a depth of eight feet, a grim discovery was made. Under the floor was human bones. Thigh bones, rib cages, legs, arms. But not one single skull. Historians soon discovered that the house had been built on the site of an ancient cemetery. One researcher, Dr. Antonio Sanchez Arjonia, he kind of discounted any possibility of trickery. He said, and I quote, The impression appeared to me to be very deep, and the images particularly expressive and well related to each other. For these reasons, if it were a fraud, it would have to be carried out, or at least directed by, a parapsychologist who is well informed in such matters, and aided by good actors and better artists. The case got stranger and stranger. Investigators, using very sensitive recording equipment, carried out a series of tests, and on a number of occasions... Uh, one Professor Germain de Argamuso got results. When the tapes were played back, strange sounds were heard. Unintelligible voices, creaks, groans. At one point, investigators thought they heard a strange melody in a child's voice, crying out, Mama, take me away from here. This was followed by the noise of someone striking a metal door. Another recording. The microphone picked up a voice asking, dig up the patio, dig up the patio. Now, as far as I can tell, no one has ever dug up the patio. The face of the woman in the hearth can change from day to day. Her eyes sometimes gaze towards the door, sometimes in the opposite direction. Now, other investigators have their own theories. Many have decided that Maria is the central influence. One theory is that these images are projected onto the surface by a type of psychokinetic photography called photography. Now, this is a term that emerged by a claim by one Ted Sirios, who believed he could put an image directly onto photographic film. I've seen some of the photos of Ted Sirios. It's interesting that some of the photos, the chimneys on the buildings he's asked to put on the film, sometimes have differences. 
three chimneys instead of four on a building, that sort of thing. Other investigators believe these faces are forged by chemical application. You need to remember one thing. One thing that makes me believe in the faces of Belmez. On February 3rd, 2004, Maria passed away. The faces continue to appear on the kitchen floor. Thank you for joining us this week on Strange Pathways. Please tell a friend. Word of mouth is the lifeblood of any podcast. Mention us on forums. You know, don't just bust into like a knitting forum and, and talk about Strange Pathways. You know, post appropriately at your own discretion. Join us over at Facebook. I'm doing a little bit more with the Facebook group. If you'd like to contact us with a story, a suggestion for a story, an experience, you can do so at strangepathwaysmail at gmail.com. Thank you for joining me this week once again. Take care of yourselves and each other. Mm -hmm.